<laughs> we have an awesome show for you today. We have six things you don't want to overreact to. Just stay calm in fantasy and don't overreact. Make sure you like this video, subscribe, share, and listen to these two crazy knuckleheads. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Uh, welcome in. The Fantasy Footballers Podcast, back for Thursday, May 19th. Jason Moore, Mike Wright, Andy Holloway with you. Big episode today. We're talking overreactions. Maybe these are players or situations the fantasy football managers are tempted to overreact to heading into draft season. So we've each highlighted a couple of things that we think are going to happen, and we want to warn you. We want to help you. So you win your league and are all together uh, happier because of it. Let's, yeah. all, let's all be champions. Yeah, we're just saying slow down a little bit on that on that crazy train you might be on. Just We're still reacting. We're just not going to overreact. Did you say the crazy train we might be on? That's what I said. Okay. All right. And we've got some news to talk about. Get into the mailbag if we have time. A couple quick reminders at the top. We're less than two weeks away from the Ultimate Draft Kit releasing. Uh, this is when the app will go live. This is when you can access 100% of the Ultimate Draft Kit, which means player profile videos, blurbs on every player, full projections for every player, sleepers, breakouts, bus values, cheat sheet creator, draft analyzers coming. Um, there's a lot going on. So if you want to take advantage of the pre-order discount, you can do so right now. UltimateDraftKit.com. It's the lowest price. We'll give you $15 in gift cards. You'll get a digital copy of our book, all for pre-ordering. So please check that out. You can find us on Twitter at the FF Ballers if you want to follow us on social media, Instagram.com slash fantasy footballers over there, and the community of listeners twenty thousand strong at jointhefoot.com. Here's your quick question today, gentlemen. Came from the website. Which team's targets have been the most difficult to figure out, divvy up amongst their receiving options. We've all been through every single team in preparation for the ultimate draft kit and the new season. We've looked at all of them. There were some teams we didn't want to click on the tab mm -hmm. and begin filling out because we knew how difficult of a situation it was. Jason, who was the most difficult for you? Yeah, usually when we don't want to click on a team, it's because of the quarterback situation. We want more clarity. But the one team that was awful for me I have very little confidence in my picking of the order of these players um, is the New York Giants because is Kadarius Toney a thing? He looked so good on the field last year. Mm -hmm. Short stretches, but he looked dominant. But then they go out and they draft Wondell Robinson, who's a very similar player. They have literally the largest cap space given to a wide receiver in the NFL in Kenny Galladay right now, so he should be the absolute dominant one, right? Sterling Shepard is probably their best overall receiver, except he's, I mean, he was Achilles late in the season, so yes. is he going to play? Is he going to get back at all in the season? Is he going to pull a Cam Akers and be there early on? You know, so it's it's just one of those things where I felt like, I think the best way to say it is I, I felt like statting them out was as gross as they will be in real life. So Which you've got bad. to experience now what fantasy players may experience later with them on their roster. That's right. And it wasn't enjoyable. No hope for Kenny Galladay from you? That's correct. Okay. No, that is correct. <laughs> if I had hope for one player, it would actually be Kadarius Toney. And, and he's the one player on this roster that I could say might not be on this roster. Oh, no. Oh. Mm, Kenny G. Mm. Route's so sh Sharp. So, I can't get enough of that final. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Mike, what about you? Uh, so I jumped in. I saw the question. My first response was actually the team you're going to talk about, Andy. And so I found my second hardest mm. one. Yeah, uh, second place. The <laughs> yes, as, as we I win as we get competitive over the quick question of our fantasy football show. Uh, it's the Kansas City Chiefs. 
What a bad pick. They have the second most vacated <laughs> targets in the NFL, yet they have arguably the best quarterback in the NFL. But losing Tyreek Hill is like that's a really big deal. They gave the money to Marquez Valdez Scantling. They drafted Sky Moore. They, like McCole Hardman, what is he on his fourth year? I mean, the, who when at the time McCole Hardman felt like he was drafted uh to be Tyreek to, to be yeah, to be the Tyreek Hill replacement, but he was it was like backed into the wall of we think we're losing Tyreek Hill and we need speed and McCole Hardman was drafted. He's hasn't panned out to be a full time contributor to this team. And it's just like you you know that Mahomes is going to get his yardage. Outside but where of, does it go? Yeah, outside of Kelsey, it is really an ensemble of, of And Juju, missed, of course. But missed upside. Mm-hmm. McCole Hardman, Marquez, uh, Clyde Edwards Alaire, Juju. These yeah. are all there are a bunch of people that if it's the you misfit toys. If you say, Hey, I'm relying on you, that's when they seem to fold. And so yeah, I know that we had a difference of which wide receiver right. ended up highest. So I mean that is an indication that there's some some things to be figured out in that offense. My situation is very similar. It's the Packers. Yeah. Um you know, all of our choices here have some of the most vacated targets in the NFL. Packers are sitting at fourth most, including 244 from the wide receiver position. So Devontae leaves 169 on the table. I think Alan Lazard is a good touchdown threat, but he is their best blocking wide receiver. They have a two running back attack with Aaron Jones and A.J. Dillon, so I don't think he can absorb all those targets, and then you start to distribute, you know, uh, Christian Watson, he's a rookie, just like Sky Moore in Kansas City, and right. then uh, Randall Cobb is still there, and then Sammy Watkins shows up. Like, they're, they're very mirror situations, and then how many do they throw to Aaron Jones, who is reliable in the right. passing game? Yeah, I, Aaron Jones, I think, will be the surprise of, like, how much his targets actually do go up, and, like, we've looked at you know, a rookie with Aaron Rodgers. They just, they don't do anything. Now, this is a little bit of a different situation of they traded up to get, you know, their who they're hoping is their next big wide receiver in Christian Watson. And Randall Cobb, I mean, when he gets targets, sure, he's okay. But like, he's capped he's, too. He's getting older and it's like, man, I just the, – their wide receivers are so confusing, and yet not like, a lot of corn left it, on that cut. Right? Yes, and then, but like Patrick Mahomes, Rodgers will throw for four thousand yards and thirty plus touchdowns. It's and it's where do they go? Yeah, and and you know Robert Tunyon coming back from injury at some point, right. so another name to mention. So some difficult teams to figure out, and we'll get we'll get some more indications maybe when when OTAs and training oh, camp and things happen those hype pieces are <laughs> they're going to be dangerous they will but you're going to have to look at them yes they they may be difficult to figure out but you're going to have to glance all right let's talk news news and notes from around the league all right, I'm going to blitz the news. Philip Lindsay, one-year deal with the Colts to come in and be a Whoa. backup to the backup. Tariq Cohen, this was uh, terrible yeah. for Tariq, the, the human being. He tore his Achilles while training on Instagram Live. Um, he knew it. It was one of the saddest things I've seen because he was just like, it wasn't pain. It was like, oh, no. Yeah. It was I know what this means, which is that my career is over. Like yeah. Tariq Cohen will never play football again in the NFL, most likely. Um, there have been some interesting uh, bits of news about a number of players, including uh, the Packers' new offensive coordinator, talking about using Aaron Jones and A.J. Dillon. We've had packages with those two on the field at the same time. You can threaten defenses. I mean, this makes oh yeah so much sense with yes, the, the need to have a pass catcher like Aaron Jones on the field. Yeah, I mean, those are probably your two best offensive pieces outside of Rodgers himself. So, yeah, you need the talent on the field, and I think that, you know, LaFleur's proven himself a good coach. I believe that he's going to tailor his offensive game plan to his personnel, and his personnel right now dictates that they should run the ball a little bit more and play to their strengths. Right now, Aaron Jones is being drafted just outside the top 12 running backs. 
Uh, I have him just inside. I don't know where he ended up for you guys. And then A.J. Dillon is being drafted as RB25, and I have him higher as well. So I, I am optimistic about both of those players and their role in this offense with, with Devontae Levy. Yep. Chris Godwin. Here's the quote from head coach Todd Bowles. <laughs> I'm, it's going to be really fun, Mike. I'll let it you comment is, I like on it. it. Better than where he was, but not where he needs to be. Mm -hmm. We don't put a timetable on it. Mm -hmm. So, great news. Torres ACL in week 15. Uh, he is healthier today than he was yesterday. Oh, that's good. You know, uh, per the human body of recovering from an injury, I am slightly healthier today than I was yesterday. Uh, but I'm I'm extremely nervous for Chris Godwin. I, I know we can see these guys come back from an ACL tear. It's, you know, not a not as not that big of a deal, but still, when it's that late in the season, in week fifteen, like that to me is a a huge red flag. When especially with like the the ADP of Chris Godwin, I think that right now, like if you look at sites like Underdog, players are they're being very very hopeful that Chris Godwin's going to be back to uh, full Chris Godwin levels of of play sooner than later, and I think it's later than sooner yeah I mean this isn't really news it's news because there was a new quote but this is more of a reminder that these you know that some of these players were injured late in the season and that 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 doesn't just mean they get to start next year healthy uh, you know next week we'll get a quote <laughs> right. on Michael Gallup right that says he's ahead of schedule yes. he's just not there yet we can't wait to get him back we hope he's ready to start the season like th this is just really remembering the end of last year can we adjust the schedule please can we adjust the ACL schedule? Because everybody is ahead of schedule, which means Change that, the schedule. that your schedule is trash, and it needs to be updated. Is it embarrassing to say that you're going according to schedule? Oh, what a – yeah. I mean, Like, I'm healing may, as maybe per the, normal. Maybe that's the problem. The, the, these is these it a guys pride are they're thing? so elite and so alpha. It's like you're, you're on schedule, and you're like, that's not good enough. Or, so like, oh, you're not ahead if, of schedule? What if this is the doctors knowing the right schedule – but to kind of pump them up, they're like, well, we're just going to add a month to that schedule when I tell them. And now Ooh. look how well they're doing from my surgery. Under promise. Yeah, <laughs> over deliver. Now, Chris, you're going to feel better tomorrow <laughs> a little bit more than you feel today. Uh, I mean, I guess it's good that his ACL is not getting worse over time, uh, yeah, right? I yes. mean, that's a that's... good thing. Uh, Mike McDaniel talked about Raheem Mostert, another backfield. None of us mentioned it in the quick question, but the backfield in Miami – Meh, that's not we'll a fun see. one. Yeah. Uh, the quote was, his expectations are to play week one. We're not going to rush it. When he's ready, he'll be on the field. And uh, one of the things in the Ultimate Draft Kit, we have an injury report talking about all of those late season injuries we're talking about. And here is what uh, our injury expert said about Mostert's injury. Suffered a cartilage injury, which required surgery. Notable for having relatively good short-term success but can cause intermittent swelling and irritation if there's too much stress. Um, basically, he can't necessarily tolerate a full workload, which is also the story of Raheem Mostert's entire career. Yeah. So you stack that up with the injury, and you look at Mostert as probably not a difference maker in fantasy. Yeah, and th this is why the Sony Michelle signing was a little bit interesting as well. Just, you know, they have the inside That's scoop true. on – where he's at and what his progress is and their worries through the season. So they're all three going to be involved, and it's going to be not delightful. All right, that is it for news, unless you got something breaking there, Brooksy. I don't. Oh, okay, <laughs> well, good, good. Let's move on. I'm not going to do what you all think I'm going to do, which is just flip out. Mike Park I don't, caught on fire. I, I, don't, <laughs> I know most people are just listening, and thank goodness for that. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you happen to be watching on YouTube, look, the PowerPoint um, <laughs> animation <laughs> animation to introduce that segment, that's a little data there, Brooksy. Can we put the, uh, the, the squad on it, you think, for next year? Maybe. 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 I mean, I, 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 could, pro I could probably do something in a took, few minutes. That took years, Andy. Um, all right. We're talking about Overreactions. I mentioned it at the top of the show. Things that fantasy football players may react to uh, excessively. There are a lot of ways that this can go, right? I mean, players react for a number of reasons. The way somebody finishes a season could drive up their ADP. 
playoff performances, right? Joe Burrow going to the Super Bowl, that can drive up a player's average draft position. We're in the middle of going through these UDK player profile videos, and a lot of that is coming up saying, hey, I like this guy this year, but I'm not going to have him on my team because he's just playing too expensive in drafts. Mm -hmm. So we each kind of picked out a couple of things to bring up. Uh, volunteers to go first here. I'll, I'll jump in here first because you, you just mentioned Joe Burrow, and that's a, a quarterback that I want to highlight. Again, all three of us, we really like Joe Burrow. He's going to be solid for fantasy football. He is a good real life quarterback. Great. He okay. He great. He is a great Thank real you. life quarterback, according to Jason Moore. Mm -hmm. But he is currently being drafted as the quarterback six on underdog. And that is too rich for my blood. So looking back at what Joe Burrow did last year, before what I will call the playoff boom tacular, where like if you had Joe Burrow on your team, and you, that would be the fantasy playoff yes, boom tackle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's exactly the fantasy playoffs. If you made it to the fantasy playoffs and Joe Burrow was your quarterback, congratulations because it was your, nice. Your odds of winning were very, very good because he went off. He was the quarterback one, two straight weeks. But before that happened, he had zero 30 point games at the fantasy quarterback position. He was the quarterback 12 in points per game at just over 18 points because the Bengals were 20th in passing attempts. And that is not going to change under the regime of Zach Taylor. They will be a balanced team skewing more towards the run. And not only where, like, those two weeks, those took Joe Burrow one into the, uh, the, the Hall of History in fantasy playoffs, which changes how we think about these players emotionally. But he, like, to get back there, he has to either have his, have his volume pumped up or he has to repeat his historic season. And when you think about Joe Burrow's season, you don't you're like, well, that is was kind of an anomaly, but it really was. Times that a quarterback has completed seventy percent of their passes and had eight point nine yards per attempt, which Joe Burrow was led the league in eight point nine yards per attempt by a, a pretty decent margin. But the times that those two statistics statistics have aligned Three times in history, including Joe Burrow. We're talking Joe Montana once, Deshaun Watson in 2020, and Joe Burrow just did it again. We've seen second-year quarterbacks who have hit the 6.5% touchdown rate, so saying that 6.5% of their attempts turn into a touchdown. The average decrease that we've seen from those players in their third year is nearly, nearly 3%. Now, like, when it's Lamar Jackson and he's at a nine and he drops down to seven, it ends up being okay. But for a lot of these guys, it's a pretty catastrophic fall in the touchdown department. And because Joe Burrow has no rushing baseline, he has to hit just incredible efficiency numbers because the, the running won't be there and the passing volume is not likely to get to a level where he can overcome if he's not nearly as efficient. And I'm just... I'm concerned that that Joe Burrow being drafted as the quarterback six, I think he's going to be disappointing for the expectations that people are placing upon so him. So the, the overreaction is on the boomtacular. Yes. People too excited from those two games at the end of the fantasy right. playoffs where that was the outlier, not the new normal. Right. Like I said, before those, before those two games to that point in the season, quarterback 12 in points per game. It's very frustrating because i agree right yeah, <laughs> yeah I, take I, that <laughs> i hear you and i i agree with the analysis and the reality of that situation i think the most at least the thing that jumps out to me the most is if you just pull those last two explosions off the map you know you have a really average fantasy season leaning to the less valuable for your team but when i looked at the you know when i projected joe burrow he right. ended up you know in that five six range now that's really irrelevant if I can't get him at a value. If I'm just paying costs for Joe Burrow and upside has a tremendous amount of risk, right? that is a problem for kind of making him a darling in fantasy drafts because you're paying the price. And, you know, he could have had two. If he had had two great games to start the year, the exact same two games, and ended the year the other direction, there's no way his ADP is where he is now. It's all about youth plus 
is he advancing? You know, we we've been here before Josh Allen and said, well, he can't repeat, and then he repeated, and and even Justin Herbert, it's like, what well, what's the reality? So yes. you kind of look at it and you say. He does have a special player in Jamar Chase. He's got a special talent. Absolutely. And both of those other quarterbacks you mentioned have special coaches um, that are uh, much better than Zach Taylor it, for fantasy football purposes. I don't care about real NFL here, <laughs> Zach Taylor. Let him throw the ball more. Air it out. Stop Which with the, this cowardice. The hope would be that you'd get the 616 pace from the last six weeks of the year as opposed to the first half. Um, but but you're right. Balance is probably the target. If they were 15th in the league, I I, I mean that would probably be that'd be an upgrade. Yeah, yeah. and they made some good moves to their defense. And, <laughs> oh, yeah, it's really upsetting stuff. They did they did do some work on the offensive line though. That is true. So that uh, hopefully in the pass blocking department. Um, I'll share one of mine, which is I wanted to kind of look at. You know, we talked about vacated targets. We talked about opportunity. And one thing I think a pattern I've noticed in fantasy football over the years is we just we're so we're so thirsty for a tight end to make a difference yep. to our fantasy roster because there are so few that do. And so I wanted to look and see what vacated targets, potential opportunity, how does it translate to new tight ends? Or I would also say one's next on the depth chart when someone departs. Do they go in and fill that void? Do they really pay off in opportunity? And I, you know, we went back and looked back to 2018 at some tight ends that had an average draft position that basically you could tell people were saying, hey, this is their year to step up. Trey Burton is one of the first examples of that. He was the sixth tight end off the board. Um, OJ Howard. Uh, in 2019, Vance McDonald in Pittsburgh. Oh. You remember the Vance dance? Yeah, it was it was too dangerous. It was a bad. He was drafted as the tight end 80, finished tight end 32. OJ Howard mm. was the tight end four in ADP, finished 29th. Hayden Hurst in Atlanta when he arrived, he was the tight end 80, finished below that ADP. Uh, Ferkser below the mm. ADP. Troutman, the Troutman mm. below the ADP. Dan Arnold. So I think we're very thirsty to see opportunities at tight end and so for 2022 here are the teams with the most vacated target numbers and then their tight ends that maybe are going to get a lot of excitement that maybe shouldn't austin hooper in tennessee with a 67 percent vacated target number totally agree david and joku and again this is not these are most tight ends are in this category of medium tight ends david and joku I've thought about David and Joku a few times this offseason. Yeah, you want to get excited. He's sure. an athletic guy. You get hopeful, but it's probably not going to happen. Yeah, Robert Tunyon, you know, with the big Packer target uh, vac vacated. Yeah. Uh, the amount. target vacation. Yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, Cole Komet in Chicago. Seen a lot of buzz around Cole Komet. Yeah, you won't stop me. <laughs> uh, Ricky Seals-Jones with the Giants. CJ Uzama with New York uh, with the Jets. And so will they matter for fantasy? Maybe on a streaming week, but probably not for any sort of vacate or bankable volume. And then I'll bring up Irv Smith, who we've had some debates about. Mm -hmm. But the Vikings only have the eighth fewest vacated targets. So there's exactly. Not, so he's fine. Yeah. So there's not a yeah, lot of I've, opportunity. I've heard an argument about too much opportunity. I know. Mm -hmm. And I know. little opportunity for Irv. Big Irv is above the law. <laughs> <laughs> It's been a, and, and it's been a while for Kirk Cousins and his tight end. So I just say, you know, be careful with Irv. You know, the tight ends for, for Cousins, 10, 16, 8, 16, 23, 16. Not a lot of targets to go around. I'm throwing the ball to Jefferson instead of Irv Smith whenever I can get an opportunity at quarterback. So don't overreact to vacated targets and then automatically put a tight end into that spot. That's the overreaction. And we've done the research Running backs are actually the beneficiary most often of vacated targets. So to amplify the Aaron Jones will have secure volume argument, that's where I would turn versus a Robert Tunyon resurgence because he was never a volume guy anyway. Right. And now he's coming off an injury. So be careful. Yeah, I, I heard you loud and clear. Clyde Edwards Alaire, RB1. Yes. Uh, I heard it. Yeah. I heard it. Uh, oh. 
Or, you, you think I'm not already thinking about that, Jason? <laughs> I just can't say it out loud anymore. Uh, yeah. You need to go into the season with Antonio Gibson and Clyde as your two running backs in every league you're in. Well, they're in my and dino. you may, and then you may never go into the season with either guy as your running back. After they're that. on my Dino squad. Yeah. Um. So my first uh, thing that I think people overreact to is the rushing upside of quarterbacks. Um. Don't now. Here, here's here's the thing. This is uh, not overreacting. We do want to react. I I talk all the time about you know the cheat code that rushing quarterbacks have. The fact that fantasy scoring is dumb and stupid and broken because you know <laughs> quarterbacks get a point for ten rushing yards and a quarter of a point for ten passing yards. They got ten yards either way. But that this isn't the debate. The debate here is just I don't want people to overreact to these great mobile quarterbacks who might not be good quarterbacks it's not a guarantee that you get, might not be Lamar Jackson right they might not be Lamar Jackson and and this year it's really a you know a, a slight caution to Trey Lance and Justin Fields um two very mobile quarterbacks who can run a ton two quarterbacks that I have in my stats in the ultimate draft kit rushing for a ton of yardage and two quarterbacks who still with all that rushing yardage are not in the top 15 for me and, you know, we, we, we see it before. If you look at their, their season, right, like uh, Justin Fields, he started 10 games. And I know, you know, it's like, oh, th three out of his last four were top 10. He literally only scored 20 fantasy points once on the season. Uh, Mac Jones did it four times, and he don't run the ball. Um, you know, Trey Lance, we saw two starts. One of those starts, he had uh, 85 rushing yards. He was the quarterback 20. If you're in a bad situation like Fields, who was in a much worse situation than Trey Lance just because of the weapons, he lost Allen Robinson, replaced him with, you know, Byron P Pringle. Um, th it's not a guarantee that just because you have the tantalizing upside of rushing that you should swing for the fences and draft these mobile guys. We saw Kirk Cousins be very, very relevant for fantasy. We saw Tom Brady be, you know, a top five quarterback. These I pocket think, passers yeah pocket passers and, and and mobile ability at the quarterback position is very important but we can't overreact and make it the only thing we care about and we're not going to draft pocket passers because they don't have the upside of the rushing quarterbacks I think that's a mistake I think you got to take a holistic approach at each player in each situation and you know look at maybe maybe just ask yourself are they a good quarterback because I like good quarterbacks. Yeah, I mean, Tebow gets brought up a, a lot because of uh, boom games, not throwing the ball well, but still figuring it out. Rushing, you know, I don't know if there's a correlation. I don't know if you dug into it, but is there a difference between the rushing quarterback with the yardage numbers or the rushing quarterback that's a viable threat on an offense to score a bunch of touchdowns on the ground? Because, you know, Jalen Hurts had a lot of goal line opportunities. Uh, Josh Allen, a lot of goal line opportunities. Cam Newton is kind of the historical example of you know that adds up right you you pass for for 16 you rush for 11 absolutely you're in a different ballpark but if you're running between the 20s and yeah. you're never in the red zone that's why I say Trey Lance has a better situation the the you know the research was if you look at the Bears they've got a six and a half win total so they're projected to lose a lot of games meaning they're not going to score um, you know, as much as the average NFL team no fantasy quarterback in the top 15 last year had fewer than eight team wins so if you're on a bad team say that one more time for for me and the audience so no fantasy quarterback in the top 15 last year had fewer than eight team wins they were all on teams that won at least eight games because what a little nugget you score <laughs> touchdowns when you win games <laughs> that, i mean that's yeah that's, that's interesting yeah i like that one up uh, in i agree with some of it uh, i know this is hard for you because those are two guys like, you you've well like i just I, I want fields to be good because i think he like i think if you dropped him onto a different team he would Can't have he would have nfl success yeah no I'd, put him in seattle he'd like, be fine it, so i think it, it i just like it sucks the situation that he was put into trey lance i still it, it, once he is actually the starter i have faith that he will be a Top twelve top quarterback, 12 because quarterback twenty twenty four. Not only does not only does he run, but he will call his number frequently at the goal line, where Fields may just not gotta, do that as just much. Got to get there. Got to get there. Um, we'll take a quick break and come back with three more overreactions to talk about. All 
All right. Uh, Mike, do you want to share a sure. second overreaction for the fantasy listener? Uh, I think that the fantasy football community right now, they are overreacting to James Conner's name and the baggage that has come along with some disappointing years from, from James Conner, the running back, as a Pittsburgh Steeler. Right now, he is the running back 15 in best ball drafts over on underdog. And I think that that is overreacting and like in fact too low under in your mind yes you are underreacting to what he did this past year with the Arizona Cardinals your running backs I want I want receiving work and I want rushing touchdowns so last year James Conner had the second most 10 zone attempts and the second most five zone attempts behind Jonathan Taylor that is not abnormal at all for what the Arizona Cardinals offense does with Cliff Kingsbury go back to Kenyon Drake when he had uh, in, in 2020, when he had that role, 35, 10 zone carries, 22, five zone carries. Like they go, they get to the, the, the red zone in the 10 zone a lot. And when they get in there, they try to run the ball and they had Connor is great. And at. Connor had a ton of success. I mean, they, they upgraded, uh, the center position last year, which I think really helped, uh, Connor get in the end zone more, but he's just, the volume is, is sticky. That's I don't think that's an anomaly that he had that much work inside the ten and the five. They just paid him uh like to come back to be the starting running back for this team for the next two years. And look at the depth chart. Someone will probably emerge and be the auxiliary running back on the squad, but at like no one on that team is really challenging James Conner for a ton of work the way that Chase Edmonds did. You have Eno Benjamin, who Eno Benjamin, okay, he's he's a fine player. They had their chance to work Eno Benjamin in a ton last year. It's probably when, Ingram when Chase Edmonds was hurt, and they chose not to. Yeah, they have they made a they have a rookie on the team. Jonathan Ward is there. Once Week Three hit, and James Conner fully exploded for fantasy football. He was the running back four in points per game. That means from Week Three forward, he had more points per game than Kamara, Leonard Fournette, Joe Mixon, Najee Harris, Dalvin Cook, and once Edmonds went down. James Conner was seeing five targets a game. So not only was the, the work inside the, the five zone secure for James Conner, the passing work also went to him. Quite a couple questions here. One is, do any of us, the three of us, have him outside our top ten at the running back position? I do not. No, no I have him at running back seven right he's now. He's nine for me. And, Jason, you said he's in your top ten. So that is – all three of us have him ranked higher than the ADP on underdog. I think that you're right about this one because when you've crowned a running back, when the fantasy community has bestowed the great crown of stardom and then removed it, right. they don't yeah, want to yeah, give yeah. it back. Leonard Fournette is the other great example of this. There was a time, his time in the sun, Connor's time in the sun, it came and went, and I think that makes it more difficult now, would you be comfortable then with Connor as your RB1 going into the season? Yes, because when I'm factoring in uh, where I'm drafting him, then yeah, I, like James Connor in the second or actually even in the like the top of the third, if you're looking at the ADP. So like I said, running back uh, 15 going ADP around spot 30. Like if you're starting the first, the early, early on in the first and you want to go wide receiver heavy and then get James Connor. I think that's a spectacular start. All right. My second overreaction I want to talk about is a very interesting one. Um, that's we, good. We have, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we have discussed at length, you know, especially with like Denver, right, where the quarterback position is so valuable to incumbent wide receivers, Cortland Sutton, Jerry Judy, to finally get a passer that can get them the ball. But I wanted to kind of look at the inverse of that. Do, because there's been a lot of wide receivers switching teams, Tyreek, Devonte, A.J. Brown. Do elite wide receivers arriving change the game for the existing quarterbacks? And can they really elevate their game? Because there are names out there right now that people, they want to project a lot of upside to. Um, and we'll talk about three of them. But historically speaking, if there's been a quarterback that isn't already elite, hasn't shown you elite talent, 
They really haven't been elevated by wide receivers in recent history. Mitch Trubisky is an example of that. Got Allen Robinson. Baker Mayfield added Odell Beckham in the offseason. Uh, Daniel Jones added Kenny Galladay. And then last year we saw Will Fuller and Julio Jones with Tua and Ryan Tannehill. And, and I know injuries were a part of that. But the two examples that were in favor were Josh Allen and Kyler when they added Stephon Diggs and they added uh, DeAndre Hopkins. So those would be kind of players that we already had a really high regard for as quarterbacks. And so then let's examine this year and say, hey, what are we really expecting from three guys, Tua Tungavailoa, Derek Carr, and then Jalen Hurts? Because Tua added Tyreek, Derek Carr added Devontae, Jalen Hurts added A.J. Brown. And so there's questions there, but historically speaking, if you're expecting a lot out of Tua and Derek Carr, you're probably going to be disappointed. They're probably not going to get elevated by those elite wide receivers uh, because they weren't already considered elite quarterbacks. So we haven't seen a lot of historical examples of that. And then the real question is Jalen Hurts, which we, we talked about him a few minutes ago about the rushing totals. Is he really going to be reinvented as a passer because the the situ the solution for Philly last year and I know we're going to debate this all summer but the solution for them to win games was to stop passing the ball as much and you can explain it away and say well you don't have a lot of great targets and Jalen Rager stinks but they they won they won because they transitioned to a running offense and look did they need more weapons yeah but AJ Brown has existed in a low you know, it's not like A.J. Brown forced the hand of Mike Vrabel and Tennessee when their offense was predicated on the right. run. He was just really efficient. So I, the you have to ask yourself that question is, what do I believe about that quarterback independent of this move? Yeah. Do I believe Jalen Hurts is an elite passer independent of picking up A.J. Brown? Because if you're not an elite passer, A.J. Brown's not going to help. If I would Mi say— Mitch Trubisky, it didn't matter if Allen Robinson was elite because he's not good enough. Yeah, I, w I would say an elite player, not necessarily an elite passer. Because Josh Allen was not thought of as an elite passer before Stephon Diggs came. He was inaccurate. You know, there were worries about whether or not he could really get it done. I do find it kind of fascinating that the two examples, obviously small sample size here, but the two examples where they really took it to another level fantasy-wise are the two very mobile quarterbacks where sure. it's like, you can't just guard against me running the ball. Kyler popped off and Josh Allen did. So yeah. Jalen Hurts, you know, maybe that's, uh, that opens the game up for him, uh, you know, because of his dual threat ability. If he's capable of it, they have equipped him to do it. Is that fair? That is fair. Because yes. that, that, you know, it, it'd be lovely if everybody ended up like Josh Allen when they add an elite weapon. Jalen Hurts, if he does it, can be the number one overall quarterback in fantasy football. Yeah. Now, here's what's really fun for me. It's Jalen Hurts and Tua who have give, – they've been given the keys to success, and they were at Alabama where it was – oh, Tua, Ooh, right. Jalen Hurts, get out of town. You stink. You're, you're not good enough to play here. Go transfer. Get out of here. Go get drafted in the second round of the NFL draft. Oh, what if he's the better guy? Uh, he is. Well, then, um, all you, right. Are you just talking for your own personal vindication? Yeah, it was, yes, this was more like a, you know, like a WWE little you know, uh, talk-up session okay. here. How, uh, how many wins did the Eagles have last year, Kyle? They went 10-7. and seven. And how many wins did the Dolphins have last year? A nine and eight. Nine and eight. Okay. So they were pretty close last year too. Yeah. I was trying I, I didn't know if they were the same or, or similar, and but nine and if you recall, the nine and eight, very impressive after they started what like Oh, and seven, I think. Or one, oh, and, one and seven. One yeah. Seven. Oh, Goodness baby. gracious. All right. They both finished strong then. Hey, speaking They did of also they they should have got rid of that coach. <laughs> with that strong finish. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um well speaking of Tua and Jalen Hurts here, my overreaction deals with both of these guys to a degree. I do to not. To a degree. To oh, a degree. Man. Oh, yeah, we did it. Um, <laughs> Wait. I don't want people. That joke has never been used. To overreact. To overreact. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. Oh, oh, yes. Okay, yeah. All right. <laughs> don't overreact to the wide receivers who just became or seems like they just became the number two on their team. We had so many giant, splashy transactions this year where Jalen Waddle was the hotness. Oh, he was the dynasty he was. superstar. He was going to be a top five wide receiver. 
But they traded for Tyreek Hill. They paid him a ton of money. Jalen Waddell is the two. And I've seen situations where it's like he's left for dead now. Um, so can, I, can I restate it for you? Sure. So you're basically saying there are players we were excited about mm -hmm. that now look like they were knocked down the depth chart. And you're saying don't worry about it as much as others are. That's exactly what I'm saying. I'm saying don't overreact when you're, when you're dealing with Jalen Waddell, Elijah Moore, Devontae Smith, and I'll throw Darren Waller in there as well. They all had, you know, Elijah Moore was was the one, and then they just used a top 10 draft pick to go and get Garrett Wilson. And now Garrett Wilson's probably the one. Is he? Maybe. Maybe not. Devontae Smith obviously just got A.J. Brown, and, you know, now Devontae Smith, who looked like he was going to take a year-two leap at wide receiver and be great going forward, you don't even want to draft him. It's a low volume offense. He's the number two guy. What can he really do when he's not the number one for his team? But the reality is these are great wide receivers and wide receiver twos on their team, even if they are the wide receiver two, are still really valuable for fantasy. And here's a stat that I think is is really telling um, for the quality of especially those three rookie wide receivers. Since 2014, 21 rookie wide receivers drafted in the first three rounds of the NFL draft have hit an 18.5 target share or better. So the, in their rookie year, they had they were really involved, 18.5% target share or better. All 21 of them maintained at least 18.5% target share the next year. 17 of the 21 increased their target share into year two. And think about T. Higgins. He's part of that group. T. Higgins had, you know, 19% target share as a rookie. Well, they spent... A, he was the waddle of, of last year. Exactly yep. right, because they got Jamar Chase, and, and it wasn't because Jamar Chase wasn't good. Jamar Chase was unbelievable, but T. Higgins is still good. Well, I get, and I guess maybe Elijah Moore is even the better comp because yeah. they spent a high draft pick on Garrett Wilson, and they had invested on Chase in the draft. Yeah, and so, you know, T. Higgins in his second year had a higher target share than Chase did um, this this last year. So Jalen Waddell had a 24.5% target market share. Uh, Devonta Smith, 22.4. Elijah Moore, 18.6. They all meet that criteria. So if you're going to get a discount in the draft because people – think their upside is gone, I would say that that's a mistake. Don't overreact. You know, They're valuable for fantasy this year. It's worth bringing up. It's one of the fallacies of fantasy football, to be honest with you, is the way – it's how binary we can be when looking at a depth chart because the NFL, the coaches, the players, the playbook, they don't work the way our brains work in fantasy. Mm -hmm. It's not one, two for these teams. Yeah, It's not like – you know, Joe Burrow is back there and saying, I have to throw the ball to Jamar Chase first on every first read. They design these offensive plays to work to all parts of the field. If you had confidence that T. Higgins could be your number one the year you drafted him, you didn't lose that confidence as a Cincinnati coach and coaching staff just because you took Jamar Chase. Right. But we look at it so between, you know, depth charts on Madden and depth charts in, in your brain on in fantasy football. I mean, I've said my biggest weakness over seven years is trusting wide receiver twos because of that exact perception issue. So let's not overreact. Okay. All right. Sounds good to me. We did it. We, we, we solved fantasy football? Yep. It's all we solved done. six things in fantasy did football. Did we take care of it, Kyle? Are we settled? You did well. <laughs> okay. Good. Good. Uh, I always want the Kyle stamp of approval. It's very important to me, the Borgogan. Uh, I think that's it for today's episode. One quick reminder, less than two weeks, ultimatedraftkit.com. Make sure you check that out if you want to hang out with the community. We do have uh, one of the things we offer at jointhefoot.com is the ability to access Foot Clan leagues. And so if you are looking for good people to play with, there are not better people than the Foot Clan. You guys are incredible. We've seen countless leagues uh, fill up with with people that are committed to playing fantasy the right way. You know, it takes one or two bad apples in a league to basically ruin it for everybody else due to inactivity, not playing players, that type of thing. So make sure you do that. Uh, I don't know if we – have we mentioned on the show that Detroit and L.A. are sold out for the live uh, events? No. So that happened quickly. Yep. And we're very we, excited. We, we did warn people that it, it was going to happen. Yeah. Well, they can. St I think there's still tickets in Phoenix. Yes. So you can go to ballerslive.com if you want to see us in Phoenix. 
L.A., Detroit, those are filled up until unless we hear something else. I think they're completely sold out. So we are looking forward to seeing all of you at both of those venues. It's going to be a lot of fun to be back out on the road doing a live show. I think we're going to do some AMA stuff at those events, so I'm I'm excited. Jason's got a whole uh, lyrical dance oh, prepared. Yeah. You Really? You do not want to miss it. Yeah. Um, I've Is been... that in lieu of the, the stage jump because of the knees and the, it, the age? It climaxes with the stage jump. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah, it's going to be just incredible. And Well, I mean, you could argue whether You the... should end with it in case something goes wrong. The like show's over, the and then... Sh the post-show stage jump yeah, because hospital trip. I was going to say, the ambulance comes after everyone's already gone. Yeah, that would be that would be easier than trying to remote me in from the hospital room. Are you, st are you still going with the, <laughs> the Nutcracker suite, or have you decided to for change? The, uh, for the dance? Yes. Oh, yeah, it's a cl it's got to be classic. Okay, I can't think okay. of something more classic than the Nutcracker. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, we did it. Uh, we got through another episode of the Fantasy Footballers. Make sure you follow the show. If you're on Apple Podcasts, click that plus. Follow us on Spotify. Thank you for listening. We'll catch you next week. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FFBallers.